Thank you, Catherine, and thank you, um, organizers of having me here and the sponsors of timing the conference perfectly with the cherry blossoms. <laughs> so, um, so as, let, me, let me try to put this um, short presentation on the contextual cues and the plight of the targets into some larger perspective. And I'm going to start by a very obvious, dumb-sounding question. Why are we concerned about bullying? If the effects of the behavior, if, if, if we focus on the effects of the behavior on others, are we concerned about the prevalence? Or are we concerned about the impact of the behavior on the targets? In all likelihood, both. Yet when effectiveness of interventions is examined, the focus is on prevalence and related factors, such as improvements on school climate. And these are clearly very important factors. But based on my very quick review um, on program evaluations in preparation for this meeting, I could not find one study, and I'm sure it's out there, and there may be a few, that examined whether comprehensive, universal anti-bullying programs help alleviate the emotional uh, pain and the health consequences of the most victimized, who are typically those who get chronically targeted. Yet to be able to foster environments that protect them, we need to first understand how bullying-related distress varies across contexts and situations. So we know that the emotional plight of the, of the targeted varies across individuals. But most of the time, we attribute this variation to individual differences. That is, we think some targets of bullying show more distressed because they lack emotion regulation abilities, they are more uh, sensitive to rejection, etc. And given the focus on individual differences, we know much less about the role of social context. For example, the group composition, the relationships in that context, how they play a part in possibly either exacerbating, uh, making the, the pain worse or making it less so. And I really um, liked Asher's comment about how the two environments that you attended, the middle school and high school, were uh, very different for you. So in order to um, address this void in the research, my colleague Sandra Graham and I, um, we've been um, trying to understand these psychological mechanisms that may, might help us understand the links between bullying experiences and emotional distress by investigating some features of the social environments of school-based bullying. Specifically, we have compared the plight of targets of bullying across schools that vary in ethnic composition. And given the social ecological um, framework adapted by this uh, workshop, I will summarize some of our findings on the targets of bullying that highlight the importance um, of the social context when bullied. Now, one of our first findings pertained to ethnic diversity. We were simply interested in what kind of environments do kids feel safe in as opposed to that they feel unsafe in. And uh, this is the kind of environment where I grew up in Finland. Very homogeneous. Everybody was um, similar. And recognizing the pitfalls of these kind of environments in terms of um, the plight of those who slightly deviate from the norm. I've been very interested in diversity issues in general and what happens in more heterogeneous contexts. So focusing here on ethnic diversity, um, we compared schools in California that varied in ethnic composition. And we had two societal minority groups, African American students and Latino students. These are all students in middle schools. Um, we um, examined the, the degree to which they felt bullied or they felt safe in 
um, different kinds of school environments. And what we find is that for these two groups, um, they felt safer and less bullied in the more diverse contexts, suggesting that there is no safety in numbers of similar others. So turning to the question of when you get bullied, could it be protective if you then have a large number of same ethnic peers? What we know based on prior research is that peer groups become increasingly ethnically segregated across grade levels, suggesting that same ethnic peers are a salient reference group. So the question then is, does the plight of the bullied vary depending on the size of his or her ethnic group? So here, um, focusing on social anxiety, what we find is that there's a stronger association between victimization and social anxiety when kids have more rather than less same ethnic peers. So the larger your group is does not make you feel any better when you get bullied quite the opposite. It intensifies bullying related distress. So that begs the question of how do targets construe their plight? That is, we know that when kids are bullied, they are likely to ask, why me? And answers to this why question, the attributions they make, are likely to affect their level of distress or their type of, the type of distress. We've been relying on a construct um, that social psychologist Chan of Pullman um, coined way back when she examined depression among rape victims, characterological self-blame. The idea that um, targets come to blame themselves and think that it's only them who get bullied and this will not change and there's nothing they can do about it. So very maladaptive um, attribution. So now what we wanted to understand, could this characterological self-blame in part help us understand why was it that the kids when they had many same ethnic peers, in all likelihood being one of the majority, numerical majority groups in their school, why would they feel worse? So we were able to examine um, this question by uh, relying on our large sample and um, examining different contexts. Contexts where the kids belonged either to the numerical majority or minority. And indeed what we found was there was a stronger association between getting bullied and self-blame when the students belonged to the um, numerical majority and there was no association when the students uh, belonged to the numerical minority in their school in terms of how bullying experience is related to self-blame. Now we have recent evidence to suggest that indeed those who are in numerical minority, they perceive the, this kind of peer mistreatment um, as discrimination, they don't necessarily self-blame the same way as the majority kids do. Rather, it's about others being prejudiced against people like me. So different interpretations of similar um, behaviors. We have, uh, moreover, um, recent evidence on self-blame possibly accounting also for continued plight of victims or targets. Specifically, we examined in the beginning of middle school during the first year when we know that there's a lot of bullying in the beginning, in the fall of sixth grade, we wanted to know who are the kids who are most likely to continue get bullied by the end of the year. And we specifically wanted to examine whether self-blame 
functions similarly to depression, both as a consequence of being bullied, as an antecedent of future um, um, plight. And indeed, what we found is um, support for these indirect associations, meaning that the kids who get targeted in the beginning of sixth grade, if they self-blame and become depressed, they are more likely to continue to get bullied throughout the school year. So just to conclude on self-blame, clearly this is one example of where contextual factors, that is something about the environment, affects how kids are interpreting their mistreatment. We know that blaming oneself is particularly detrimental and finally to alleviate distress and reduce the duration of bullying we may need to change targets attributions. But let me, let me end with something a little bit more positive. Um, so we know that um, there's one particularly potent protective factor, and that is kids having friends. Although the type of friend matters, there is good evidence suggesting that as long as a child has one friend, that lowers the risk of being bullied. Moreover, when they do get bullied, their distress is alleviated if they have that one friend. So I have two recent doctoral students who did their dissertations on a topic that um, extends this research. And um, the first one focusing on cyberbullying, so we are switching to another context. And another um, focusing on experimentally, uh, experimental manipulation of exclusion. And these studies, in part, help us understand, is it really about a friendship, or is it something more fundamental? So let me turn to the first study. So Cordelope Espinosa um, uh, conducted a, a study on cyberbullying, where she examined the daily experiences of being cyberbullied and um, daily level of distress. Um, she was particularly interested in the role that friends play, and she assessed both the quality of the friendship and the, just merely the time spent with the friend. What she found was that on days when high schoolers got cyberbullied, there was a particular strong association with distress. But if during that day when they got cyberbullied, they got to spend some time with a friend, that distress was significantly and substantially alleviated. And what was really interesting is that the quality of the friendship did not matter. It was merely time spent. Let me now turn to the final study, and this involved um, experimental manipulation of social exclusion. Some of you may know um, a paradigm that is available to all of us online, a cyberball paradigm, where um, individuals are part of tossing a ball, and then all of a sudden the partners exclude you from tossing the ball. And as benign as it, as it sounds, it's an incredibly potent uh, way to induce feeling of exclusion. This particular student, Elisha Gross, what she did is she experimentally manipulated exclusion and after exclusion she, she um, randomly assigned the participants to either socially interact through IM, that is through the computer, with an unknown peer or to play a solitary um, computer game. So either a social interaction with an unknown peer or a solitary um, uh, computer game. And what she was interested in examining was the recovery from that exclusion. Specifically focusing on um, how quickly 
ki kid, these uh, kids and young adults recovered from loss in self-esteem. What she found was the recovery was much quicker for those who had a chance to interact with an unknown peer as opposed to playing a solitary computer game. So these findings suggest that maybe it is not even about a friend, but when kids get bullied, they need to replenish their self-esteem, their distress by connecting with someone. So um, let's put the bullying problems in context. I would say that the context of situational factors indeed matter in how distressed and lonely targets feel. By examining these kind of contextual and situational variations, we can get further insights how to alleviate distress. And based on just these few examples of our work here, um, I think that we have at least two potential antidotes. One, that we convince kids that it's just not them who get targeted. And the second, that even a neutral social interaction can help reestablish sense of connection. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jana, that was great. It's great to hear the application of that work to the issue of bullying and helping us think a little bit more broadly about person environment fit in the context. And I'll particularly pick up on the theme around connectedness when we get a little bit later on. We're really excited to have uh, Tracy Valancourt here today from the University of Ottawa. As you heard uh, in terms of Dr. Liu's opening comments, there's great interest in understanding some of the biological mechanisms associated with stress and certainly youth involvement in bullying serves as a major stressor. And so Tracy's really leading the way in helping us understand some of those biological mechanisms in, turn of, in terms of stress reactivity in the body and the brain. So with that, I'll introduce her. Thank you, Tracy. Thanks.